So actually, your New Testament is your biggest critic. And I even noticed that the speaker was quoting rabbinic texts, trying to prove his points, like we consider these texts divinely inspired, which I have only quoted scripture in this discussion, because Judaism, friends, has never held that the works of the rabbis are necessarily inspired. In other words, if something that a rabbi says doesn't either build up or confirm what's in Tanakh, according to Judaism, it's not divinely inspired and could be tossed out. Unlike Christians who have canonized the New Testament and try to stand by every word no matter the contradictions. So perhaps you should study Judaism before commenting on it, or at least as much as I have studied Christianity. And then the speaker stated that there was no historian that ever claimed that any trinity-like Godhead existed before the rise of Christianity. He even said zilch, nada. Really? So what's this? The 19th century scholar and Protestant minister Alexander Hislop developed several chapters of his book The Two Babylons showing how the original belief in one God was replaced by the triads of paganism which were eventually absorbed into Catholic Church dogma. Also the Egyptologist Eric Hornan stated that ancient Egypt was actually a monotheistic society made up of one god with many smaller gods usually grouped in threes. Also the historian S.H. Hoke tells us in detail the ancient Sumerian trinity. Anu was the primary god of heaven, the father, and the king of the gods. Enel, the wind god, was the god of the earth and the creator of God. And Enki was the god of waters and the lord of wisdom. Also, the historian H.W.F. Sags explains that the Babylonian triad consisted of three gods of roughly equal rank, whose interrelationships solidified the essence of their nature. Also, in his work, Egyptian Myths, George Hart, lecturer for the British Museum and professor of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics at the University of London shows how Egypt also believed in a Trinitarian God. He states that the God was really three gods in one. Re was his face, Ptah his body, and Amnun his hidden identity. No sources, huh? Well, I got more. The great historian Will Durant states in his work, Caesar and Christ, that the idea of the Trinity originated in pagan Egypt. Durant even bluntly stated that Christianity did not destroy paganism, it adopted it. Dr. Gordon Lang, retired dean of the humanities department at the University of Chicago, agrees that the worship of the Egyptian triad Isis, Serapis, and the child Horus probably was the origin of what later became known as the Trinity in Christianity. Lang convincingly devotes his entire book, Survivals of the Roman Gods, to the comparison of Roman paganism and the Roman Catholic Church. And there's more, friends. Dr. Jaroslav Pelikan, a Catholic scholar and professor at Yale, confirms that many of the Catholic Church's doctrines originate from pagan ideas. Even the historical lecturer, Jesse Benedict Carter, stated that the Roman Catholic Church got the idea of the Trinity from the Babylonian Trinity of Tania, Uni, and Minerva. And friends, even Pope Gregory made it clear when he said, You must not interfere with any traditional beliefs or religious observances that can be harmonized with Christianity. And there are many, many more sources I can quote, my friends. But for lack of time and to save some embarrassment for the speaker, I'll just let you do the research on your own. Next, non-Jews translating Alma as virgin. The speaker's claim is that the prophecy about the virgin birth was never understood by Christians as a prophecy referring to virginity at all, but only about the child being called Emmanuel. Well, let's put his credibility to the test again. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 through 24. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, and I will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So if Joseph understood the prophecy as only referring to the naming of the child, instead of assuring him that his wife didn't commit adultery and is still a virgin and suitable for marriage, why does he name the child Jesus instead of Emmanuel at the end of the narrative, right? Serious theologians, huh? <laughs> Very serious, right? 
The speaker also claims that the only reason Christians translate the word Alma as virgin is because it appears as virgin in the Septuagint. So perhaps the speaker thinks that because Matthew was quoting from the Septuagint version of the prophets, it was in some way translated by Jews and is thus authoritative. And also we have to ask, if this source is so authentic, why was the writer who was supposedly familiar with Hebrew quoting the Greek text and not the original Hebrew text? But anyways, friends, anyone who wants to do the research could find out for themselves that the Septuagint translation by the Jews only contained the five books of Moses, not the whole Tanakh, which includes the prophets. No, friends, the complete Septuagint version we have today was actually translated by the church, which actually throws a whole wrench in the authenticity of Matthew. And for those who are not aware of the argument in the Hebrew version of Isaiah 7.14, the word virgin never appears in the text. Only the word young woman referring to a present event, not a future event. But it's not hard to know why the speaker had to bring this up. Why? Because it's a complete, clear contradiction of the New Testament text. Next, the speaker believes that I said that the concept of the Messiah does not appear in Scripture. Now, this is just another silly, simple Christian mistake of confusing the Torah with the Nevi'im and Ketuvim. Friends, what I said is that the word or the idea of Messiah does not appear in Torah in the five books of Moses. It obviously does appear in the other writings. And the reason that I said this is that Christianity teaches that it was the law of Moses that will condemn the Jew. But if there's no commandment in the law of Moses that states that you must believe in a Messiah, what particular law will be doing the condemning, my friends? Silly, huh? In other words, if there was never a law that when the Messiah arrives you must believe in him, what did the Jews do wrong? And why are they, according to the New Testament, condemned to a fiery hell? Again, because there was never a commandment to believe in the Messiah. Nonetheless, I do believe in the coming of the Messiah, but the reason the commandment does not appear in Torah is because when he does appear, belief won't be necessary. For it states that in that day one man will not have to teach his neighbor know the Lord, for they will all know him from the least of them to the greatest. And the knowledge of the Lord will fill the world as the water fills the sea. Friends, Judaism, unlike Christianity, does not and has never believed in some heavenly bailout. The Almighty appointed the Jewish people to be a light into the nations, and that light is Torah. It is our job to elevate this world through the keeping of God's will and the proper understanding of ethical monotheism to its final messianic state, which will be ruled by the king from the line of David through Solomon. Vicarious atonement, my friends, is not only unethical and irresponsible, but it's a cop-out, which deprives us of the pleasure and responsibility of physically confronting evil and making the world a better place. Today, my friends, could be the beginning of an awesome journey. You can choose to become Jewish and live by God's holy standard for humanity. If you're interested in learning more about Torah Judaism, please visit BeJewish.org. And if you're interested in converting to Judaism, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.